Welcome, welcome everybody. Good night. This is Tom Kolb here from North Dakota State University and we're here at the 2017 NDSU Spring Fever Garden Forums. Today is April 10th, 2017 and tonight is the fourth of our four forums in which we bring NDSU experts to you to help you care for your yard and garden. Again, I'm Tom Kolb, I'm an extension horticulturist for NDSU, and I'm here with Robert Birch from Ag Communications, the man behind the camera who makes all this happen. We are live at North Dakota State University campus in Morrill Hall Studios, and we are beaming our broadcast to 30 county extension offices across the state. Welcome to you, and welcome also to all the other gardeners who are joining us on their home computers. All right, at first we're going to get right to it, and we're going to start talking about raised bed gardens, a hot topic right now. And raised bed gardens are popular because they look beautiful, and they're easy on your back. You don't have to bend down so far to pull out the weeds, and the plants grow well in them too. Here to help you tonight to learn how to build your own raised bed gardens is Steve Sagasser. Steve is the Agricultural Natural Resources Agent for Grand Forks County. Steve, welcome to the forums. Well, good evening, gardeners. And so Tom told me not to tell a joke, so the first thing I got to do is tell a joke. And uh, so I was at gardening Saturday on Saturday and walking down the hallway, and one of my gardener friends comes up to me and says, Steve, I got a question for you. And I said, what's your question? She said, what did the rosemary say to the sage? And I said, I don't have any idea. What did the rosemary say to the sage? And she said, it's about time. So, gardeners, it's about time that we learn a little bit about raised bed gardens. So that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about building raised bed gardens more than we're going to actually talk about growing things in raised beds. So we'll go ahead and get started right now. And you can see on the slides there that there's a lot that you can do with raised beds. Raised bed gardens are just as diverse as we as people are. They can come in all kinds of shapes, size, forms, and, and all kinds of different flavors. And so you can have them multi-levels. You can build them out of landscape timbers. You can build them out of, out of railroad ties, although I don't recommend that. Uh, you can build them out of concrete blocks. You can raise them totally up off the ground, as you can see in the picture in the lower right-hand corner there. I did have a picture of some stacked up tires for our raised bed garden, but I thought that was less than aesthetically pleasing to the eye, so I didn't even include that. But uh, yeah, anything that will hold soil can become theoretically a raised bed garden. So it basically just depends on what your imagination wants to conjure up. We use raised bed gardens quite a bit with our junior master gardeners because they're nice, they're concise, they're confined, and they do a nice job of helping things stay within bounds. This is a raised bed garden that's made out of concrete patio pavers, and it's about 18 inches high in the picture on the left, and then it slopes down to the grass line, so it's got a slant to it, gets natural drainage but it does a really nice job of getting the plants up out of the ground quickly. And these are some of our master gardeners, and you'll probably recognize our 4-H youth agent, Terry Knutson, in that left, or that right-hand picture. But you can also get raised bed garden kits if you want to. We use them quite a bit for school gardens, and we've got a lot of raised bed kits for our school gardens. And this is a group of highly motivated extension agents and you give them a couple of drills and a screwdriver and look at them go to work and you get some good teamwork and voila there's your raised beds all ready for soil this worked out really fine personally i prefer to build mine out of locally available materials rather than purchase the kits but when you're in a hurry and you have to get the job done this is a nice way to go we use raised bed gardens, as I just mentioned, for our school gardens. And uh, you know what's really nice about that is it helps the children, whether it's regular gardening or gardening in raised beds, it gives them an opportunity to learn the difference between weeds and vegetable plants. It gives them some something to shoot for when they're looking for the vegetables. Throughout the gardening season, they can sample some of the fruits and vegetables of their labor. And uh, then at the end of the gardening season, a lot of times the leftover produce, we take that into the cooks in the school lunch program. They love it. Granted, there's not a lot of vegetables left over that can serve hundreds of students, but just the fact that those vegetables were raised 
on their school grounds in their raised vegetable gardens and that those kids had a hand in it. That gives them bragging rights and it's just a nice, fun thing to do and it builds that enthusiasm and that incentive to go home and get started with growing their own vegetables. And that's what it's all about is eating right and growing their own vegetables. These are two raised bed gardens that I built in my own yard a few years ago. And we're going to get into the nitty gritty on how you can build raised bed gardens simply and as easily as I built these. And I didn't necessarily have a set of plans drawn out on paper, but I did have a set of plans that I conjured up in my mind. And so essentially what you're going to need is a few tools, not many. I like to protect my knees, so I think you should if you have any interest in uh, protecting your knees when you're kneeling on a hard concrete surface like you're going to see in a few minutes, get a hold of some good knee pads. And you'll need a circular saw of some sort or some sort of a cutting tool, but a circular saw works really nice. Tape measure is absolutely essential. And if you can beg, borrow, or steal an electric cordless drill and a cordless driver, it'll help you tremendously as far as getting your project done. You've got to have a good hammer and a carpenter's square. And then not one, but two pencils, because you will break at least one of them in the process. So this is the materials list for one 4 foot by 10 foot, 12 inch high raised bed garden. You're going to need at least, well, you'll need two 2 by 12s, 10 foot long. You'll need two 2 by, or one 2 by 12, 8 foot long. Then you'll need two 2 by 4s, 10 foot long, and one 2 by 4, 8 foot long. You'll also need some scrap 2x4s so that you can use those for corner posts. They don't have to be anything fancy, but they should be made out of a treated type of material, like the material that you're building your raised beds out of. You should have some 3.5-inch deck screws, and you also should have some 3-inch screws, even though that's not listed on this bill of materials. You should have some 3-inch deck screws as well. Now, the material I use for my raised bed gardens is not arsenic-treated green lumber. It's treated green lumber and is fully safe for using for raised beds, but the arsenic treated lumber has not been sold regionally for a long time, so you don't have to worry about using it for that type of a purpose. The first thing that you should do is square the ends of your boards, and uh, you will typically get a 10-foot board that's about 120 and one-half inches or a little bit more, a little bit less long, so that gives you some room to cut off the ends to square them up. So take that nice carpenter square of yours and square up that end, draw a straight line, and then move that straight edge or that carpenter square over enough that you can use it as a straight edge when you're actually making that cut. But if you, if you are like me and you're directionally challenged and you're trying to cut a straight line freehand, you might not have done any good trying to square up the end of that board. So that's where, again, I suggest using that carpenter square as a straight edge so that you can cut that line that you just finished drawing and keep it nice and straight. Do that on every one of your boards on one end. And then when you cut them to length, you should not have any problem having the other end just as square. So measure off and cut that 10-foot board down to exactly, exactly 120 inches. And measure and cut your 8-foot 2x12s to exactly 48 inches. You have to be perfect with these cuts. Otherwise, your raised bed garden will not be square. Now, if that doesn't bother you to not have a square one, I guess that's okay. But for me, I have to have mine square. And once you've gotten everything cut, then you should start to assemble them. And this is where it helps to have a nice, smooth, flat surface that's big enough to move around on. What I do, if it's a nice, smooth surface like my driveway slab, I just set them up, join them together as best I can. And then um, when I've got the shape that I want, I like to clamp things together with a couple of pipe clamps. That acts as that extra pair of hands for you and keeps things standing upright. There's nothing more frustrating when you're working by yourself and have boards falling down that you've just ended up scoring up. Now, when you put these pipe clamps on, and if you don't have pipe clamps, that's not the worst thing. You don't have to have them, but if you can borrow some, even if you don't own your own, it really does a nice job of helping keeping things together. But you do want to just keep them loose enough, loose enough to keep from falling off and hitting the ground, but um, um, tight enough so they won't fall and hit the ground, but loose enough so that you can move the boards around. 
because you've got a job now where you have to measure diagonally from one corner to the opposite corner on the other end to square your raised bed. This is really important. Now, if you look here in the upper right hand corner and the lower left and the lower right hand corner, you'll see that when I've measured diagonally from one corner to the other twice, both measurements show 130 inches and 7 sixteenths. They're both exactly 137 and 130 inches and 7 sixteenths. And when I get those measurements to be exactly the same, I know that's assuming that I've cut my boards exactly the same length. I know my raised bed is square. And that's important because you'll need to uh, have it square down the road when we start leveling it up and putting it in its position. After you've gotten a square, then fasten some diagonal temporary braces on the bed, and that'll serve two purposes. It'll hold it in place while it's being while you're putting your fasteners in the ends, but you also need to leave those on for when you pick it up and move it to its location, its permanent location. So put those temporary diagonal braces on. There's no rocket science with how you do that. They just have to be fastened down at an angle and you need to use at least two of them. Now, when you prepare to drill, when you prepare to drill, drive your screws in, it's really important, especially when you're working about three quarters of an inch from the edge of a board to pre-drill those holes. If you don't pre-drill those holes, you're going to split the edge of the board and once you split the edge of the board it doesn't have the holding power to keep that raised bed tight the screws won't have the holding power to keep everything tightened up and intact the way they should be so pre-drill all of those holes and then go ahead and run your screws in and uh, you should be in pretty good shape i usually put up i usually put about five screws in per, per corner you can use six if you'd like but no less than five you need to have enough screws to have good holding power So remember those diagonal braces? They do a beautiful job of keeping everything squared up and intact when you, when you and a friend or maybe two friends pick up that raised bed and start to move it. Now these things most often are wet because the material hasn't fully cured and they're heavy. So don't try to move your raised bed by yourself for obvious reasons. First, it could hurt you physically, but you also could bang it up enough to knock it out of square and then you're really having to start all over again, or you probably cause some damage to it. So it needs to pick, be picked up and carried with two or three people, uh, hopefully a couple of people besides yourself. Then what I suggest doing is taking those scraps, those scrap two by fours that we talked about, and using those as corner posts. And uh, now maybe leveling your raised bed isn't important to you, but my soil slopes away a little bit in my yard where I have my raised beds. And so I like to have the beds leveled, and I'll use the corner posts, one in each corner, and I'll use wood clamps like you see here. I'm gonna back up once, one time here. If you look at the picture on the left, and uh, look closely on the lower right corner, the upper left corner, and the lower left corner, you'll see where I've clamped those posts in place with wood clamps. That's really slick because you can elevate or lower that raised bed as much as you like, whatever it takes to get it level. And then when you've got it perfect the way you like it, so it's nice and level, tighten those wood clamps and drive in your three inch screws from the outside into those posts. That'll hold everything in place, it'll keep it square. And if you've measured appropriate, the appropriate distance from your other raised beds, then everything will stay put nicely. Once you've gotten that done, then you can go ahead and remove those diagonal braces. And that takes us to the next step where you need to cut those corner posts off. I use a reciprocating saw. You can use a hand saw just as nicely. Saws that probably won't work would be a saber saw or a circular saw. You'd probably cause damage to the raised bed or yourself if you tried to do that. So if you don't have a reciprocating saw, just take a hand saw. It works very nicely for cutting those posts off and for leveling things up. What I like to do, and this isn't required, but I strongly suggest doing this, is using a top two by four around the perimeter of the raised bed. When you have a length of wood that's 10 feet long, there's a possibility that the pressure of the soil on the inside of the raised bed can push the board out and it won't necessarily cause damage, but aesthetically it's not very pleasing to the eye. If you put this top cap on, I call it, 
then it provides a nice convenient seat when you're out sitting and when you're weeding your raised bed or picking some vegetables and you want to just sit down for a minute. It's a lot easier to sit on a three and a half inch wide board than it is a one and a half inch upright board. So it gives you a little bit of a seat, but more importantly, it strengthens that length of board and keeps it from wanting to bow out. And it's worked nicely for me for several years on my existing raised beds. I haven't had any bowing problem at all. So what I suggest doing, those have to be cut to exactly 120 inches as well, and then drive two screws, as you see in that lower right-hand corner, through the existing length of uh, two by 10, and then drive another one through the corner post and through the end piece. And uh, by doing that, you're helping to tighten up the corner even more and uh, making it stronger. So there it is with all four of the caps in place. It's a finished raised bed and now it's waiting for soil. And uh, we'll talk about soil a little bit next and what we can be putting in there. I want to first mention though, a location is really important. Try your best to get your raised beds in a minimum of eight hours of good full sunlight per day. I think that's really important. If you don't have good sunlight, you're just not going to have good adequate growth of your plants and everything will have been wasted. All of your time and hard labor and everything will have been wasted. You won't be satisfied with the results of your work. So full sun is really important. Obviously you can't have probably sun from morning till, till dusk, but do your best to get at least eight to, 10, 12, eight to 10 hours of sunlight, ideally 12 hours of sunlight a day. And then try to get some place where it's close to water. Because yes, you will have to water your raised beds. They'll take water just like a conventional garden would, but in many cases, they'll take even more water. We'll need more water. So some place where you can reach it easily with the garden hose will be very important. And then if you have the option, try to locate it close to your kitchen. Consider a mini kitchen garden. It's a whole lot easier to run out 15 or 20 feet from your kitchen door and snip off some spinach leaves or uh, to whip up a quick salad or grab a handful of string beans in the evening when it's just a few steps away than it is to have to walk 150 feet out or to a backyard somewhere and find it. So the closer you can make it to the kitchen, the more you'll find that you enjoy it, the more enjoyable it'll be, it'll be to run out and grab something and just the more convenient it will be all the way around. So location really is important. So let's talk a little bit about soil. Soil can come in a lot of different types of, uh, a lot of varieties as well, but ideally it needs to be loose and needs to be well drained and it needs to have some available nutrients in it. The best soils are a balance between clay, sand, and some organic matter. And they all have their purposes. The sand will provide some drainage if your soil is a little bit dense. Our soil here in the Red River Valley is really dense in many cases. If you're gonna to attempt to use that soil by itself in your raised bed, you're gonna be in for a big disappointment. You wouldn't use just pure garden soil dug out of your garden in a raised bed any more than you would put it into a container and expect to have good results. You do need to add some amendments to your soil to make it what you like it to be. Sand, of course, I already mentioned, but some peat moss like you see in the upper right-hand corner, some compost or well-decomposed manure will work really well. You don't have to use all of these, but they all will give you improvements in your soil. A sandy loam soil in the lower left-hand corner, that's the soil that I'm holding, and I just dug, scooped that out of my raised bed one of my existing raised beds a few days ago and took that picture. It's just fun to play with it. It's just a nice, light, fluffy soil, and it's got a great smell as well. You might want to add some vermiculite or some perlite, probably not important, but uh, weathered sawdust works really well. And let me just give you a little caveat on that. Don't go onto a local sawmill or lumber yard and pick up a bunch of sawdust and bring it home and think you're going to have good success by putting that in your raised bed. Pick it up, yes, if it's free, it's even better. Bring it home, but put it in a pile where you can let that sit for a year. It needs a minimum of a year in the sun and rain falling down on it to wash all the impurities out of it and to wash, it, wash the salts out. And if it's looking pretty good after a year, maybe you should set it, let it sit for two years. It needs to be looking almost like soil before you mix it up into your raised bed. But then it'll be a really nice additive and uh, add some of that organic matter that your soil is going to really enjoy. Now, as I mentioned, drainage is important. But you can, I suggest using local sources, you know, mix your own, mix your own soil and uh, use those local sources. But if you just aren't into that, alternatively, you can use purchased high quality bagged or premixed bulk soil. But what that's going to do is it's going to skyrocket the price 
of your raised bed. It's going to take a lot longer for you to really enjoy the payback from that raised bed if you put a lot of money into ready mixed potting soil. But remember, it's also important to remember that the crop that you have growing in that raised bed is going to use soil nutrients each year. <clears throat> what you put in this year is not going to be the same soil that you're going to have at the end of the season. So you do need to add nutrients annually if you're going to keep that productivity where you want it to be. I'm not suggesting that you take a soil test every year, but I am suggesting that you keep in mind that your plants are using nutrients, so you have to add some nutrients back in. It's important whether you're conventionally gardening in a regular ground type of garden or in raised beds, but it's probably even more important in, in raised beds. So I'm just about ready to wrap it up here, Tom. I just want to say this as kind of a closing, that raised bed gardening, it's a lot of work to get started. I won't lie to you. You have to build these beds. You have to fill them with soil. You got to make sure you got everything balanced right. You got to level them all up. So it's a lot of work to get started, but then that's where it gets fun. Once it's established, it's easy gardening thereafter. You don't have that many inputs of labor and other materials to make it fun. And so let's just get started. Let's start doing some raised bed gardening. Okay, thank you, Steve. And let's, uh, we're, we encourage your questions now. Steve, we're gonna get right to them. Uh, what kind of clamps did you use? Were those pipe clamps? Those were pipe clamps, Tom. And uh, the pipe was, it was three quarter inch pipe and the clamps were called pony clamps. You can pick them up at your local building supply store or hardware store. You will have to have the ends of the pipe threaded and uh, your local hardware store can cut the pipe to any length you want it to and they can also thread it for you. It has to be threaded uh, at the same diameter, of course, as the pipes, as the clamps are. So you can buy either half inch clamps or three quarter inch diameter clamps. And I use the three quarter inch ones and they're slick to use, but you can use they don't have to be pony clamps, they can be any brand of clamp, but they just give you that extra set of hands and help keep things more intact. Good, how about, is there concern with cinder blocks containing fly ash and leaching toxic compounds? Have you heard that before? I've heard that just as individuals say they have problems with planting annuals and perennials next to the newly poured concrete foundation. And there may be some truth to that. I personally haven't experienced that but I don't have any new cinder blocks to work with. The cinder blocks that I do use for some of my smaller raised beds, which aren't very many, are well weathered, and some of them are quite a few years old. So if there was any leaching that was going on, it was prob it's probably long since leached out. But that's certainly something to be c concerned about and uh, maybe something we need to look into a little further. Okay. Um, you could always talk to the manufacturer, huh? Get some information from them. Huh? Exactly. They, they be a good source of information. Mm -hmm. How about uh, composite decking material? Can we use that to construct a raised bed? Or are you worried again about chemicals, harmful chemicals leaching into the soil? I haven't used composite decking material before, but I do believe that the material that we purchased the raised bed kits for our school gardens was made out of similar, if not the same material. And uh, they're, they're, they were designed for raised beds. They're, shouldn't have been or there aren't any problems that we we used or discovered so far with that but again that might be something to check with the manufacturer about my larger concern would be that the composite deck boards are not very thick and consequently i think unless you reinforce them quite stoutly you're going to have some bowing taking place that would be a bigger concern of mine but regarding whether there, there would be leaching taking place of some toxic materials uh something that would be another question that you could follow up with the manufacturer on. Steve, have you ever used PVC pieces that you add to the corners and then you make a little hoop house and you cover with polyester maybe to protect from frost? Have I have not. That? I have not done that, but I know that there are a lot of individuals that have made many hoop houses or many uh, tunnels uh, that work really nicely for that. I haven't found a reason to have to worry about that, but uh, it's certainly a way to begin your garden earlier in the spring and to keep it growing longer in the fall. So it's not difficult to try that, and you can find multiple videos of uh, mini hoop houses like that on any one of the YouTube channels. How about, uh, do you put fabric at the bottom before you put the soil in the box? I do not. 
I like to have, I like to can, I like to visualize my raised bed as just being an extension of the existing soil. So if the roots of my carrots want to decide to grow really long, or or if the root systems need to get down there as deep as they want to get for whatever plants I'm growing, they've got that option to do that. Whereas if there are are landscape fabric types of barriers in the bottom, then I think that that could potentially cause some problems. And the other reason that I don't do it is because I'm I'm working with a raised bed that's 12 inches high. So I'm not concerned about quack grass or any other bad type of weed having enough tenacity to come up through that that much soil. And I haven't had that problem develop yet. And I'll be honest with you, my lawn is not free of quack grass. There's quack grass growing right around my raised beds that you saw in the photos there. And I have not had any quack grass strong enough to push its way up through that. Do you have a minimal height for your bed? Like you have 12 inches. Can you get away with 8 inches, 6 inches? Have you ever tried a lower height? I have never tried lower heights other than our school gardens. Those are 8 inch high raised beds. And we do not have landscape fabric or anything in the bottom of those. And we have not had problems with weed infiltration either. But uh, the more shallow the raised bed becomes, the less of an advantage you have by having a raised bed. And at some point, there's really, the lower you go, let's say you made it out of a two by four, um, yeah, it'll be a raised bed. But let's face it, folks, the whole idea behind a raised bed is to get it up out of the ground for multiple reasons. One, for convenience of not having to get down so low. You have better uh, control of what's taking place because you don't have weed infiltration. If it's 12 inches high, the local cottontails can't even jump into it, which I've discovered is quite nice. Um, so there's a lot of advantages to being a little bit higher, but if you can't afford 2x12s, 2x10s or 2x8s will work just fine. But as you get smaller, you lose some of those advantages. So Steve, are you telling me that uh, cottontail rabbits and Grand Forks can only hop 12 inches? They can't even make it 12 inches. What They're is fat wrong and lazy. Guys? They need a snowbank to stand on. They need a three-foot fence to control cottontails, <laughs> except for Grand Forks. Well, you 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 must They're identify your huh? cottontails. You're talking about jack rabbits. Jack rabbits. Not four feet with a jack rabbit. <laughs> you got unhealthy cottontails here. Um, also, I like to. I never use landscape fabric underneath there. I see no reason for it. And I also, either. I scrape. I scrape the uh, native soil because I don't want to have a layering, any type of layering mm -hmm. in, uh, in case. Can you bring up a good point when you say that, Tom? If you want the ultimate advantage before you put your soil in, and I do this as well, till up that soil, loosen it up, that existing soil that you're going to put your new soil on top of, so you don't have those layers of. Uh, a division developing there so that you don't have any barriers keeping your root system from going down if they want to. Well, have you heard anything about what direction they should face? North, south, east? Should they go north to south or east to west? Or it It's only sense? important when you're going east to west if you're going to be growing tall plants. And if you remember and those some of those original photos, the earlier photos I showed, you could see some tall poles coming out of a couple of my raised beds. Well, I had tomatoes on those. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you right now, if you try to put tomatoes on the south and carrots on the north, you won't have anything growing except for your tomatoes. So it's ideally, if you're going to go east and west, you have to keep that in mind. Put the tall things on the north. And mine are east and west. Now, I grow a lot of grapes, and my grapes all go north and south, so I get equal amounts of sunlight in the morning and the afternoon. And so if you have the option, I would say go north and south. But if you don't, I chose to go east and west, and they do just nicely fine. Yeah, just make sure it's sunny. Mm -hmm. How about uh, any other wisdom you can share about using cement blocks? Well, like I said, I don't use them very much. The few times I have used them, they're old, and I'm not concerned about anything leaching out of them, uh, other than the fact that you might want to find out what they're made out of. I don't think I can really offer too much more insight on what may or may not be a problem with them. How long do you expect your beds to last? The lumber is guaranteed to last 20 years. And um, okay. if they last that long, I probably won't be too worried about it after that anyway. 
That's right. <laughs> or I'll be building new ones. We'll be talking I'll be about this all over. Wheelchair guarded. You'll be. I'll want them a little higher. I'll have to reach in from a chair. That's right. Uh, what kind of wood do you suggest if you want to build your raised bed all the way to waist high? I would use the same materials, right. but that does not mean you have to add waist heights of soil. You can put a false bottom in them if you want to. You want to make certain that you included some drainage in that false bottom, but I still would try to have a minimum of 12 inches of soil. Okay. Uh, you know, when you put the boards together, do you use any glue? No, I see no advantage to using glue. Although if you're a woodmaker, a woodworker, and you do want to use glue, make sure you're using some sort of a waterproof spar type of glue, an outdoor boat making type of glue, because it'll definitely get wet. Indoor Elmer's glue types of glues will not last. But if you fasten them good with three and a half inch minimum screws on the corners, but better, you can even go with four inch screws. Just make sure they're deck treated screws that are treated with the material that they won't deteriorate. That's the important thing. And at least three and a half inches long. I don't see a reason for using glue. How about, have you ever used pallets? Are they safe to use for gardening? Pallets generally are not made out of treated lumber. To the extent that yes, they would be as far as unless unless a toxic chemical had been spilled on them, perhaps they've been used to hold barrels of waste oil or something. There might be an in, instance there where they wouldn't be good to use for raised beds. The only concern about uh, using pallet wood is that yes, it's probably free, but it's not going to last very well, long because since it's not been treated with the preservative, it's going to deteriorate, and uh, within four or five years, you're probably rebuilding it again. It's pretty thin, huh? Mm -hmm. Pretty it's thin, and it won't be sturdy. And uh, and you don't have that option to go long. You'd, you'd probably be restricted to the length of whatever the pallets are. Um, you'll put a lot more lumber, a lot of a lot more time into it if you're going to use those types of materials. But I'm not against that. Mm -hmm. Pallets make a lot of nice projects. Okay. How about have you tried putting a panel over the edges of two raised beds for vines? Put a panel over the edges of two raised beds. Maybe two raised beds I can put a panel over them to allow for vines to climb over. I can say that I haven't. Yeah. Uh, I, with my vining types of plants, whether they're cucumbers or tomatoes, uh, I have not done this with cantaloupes, but my cucumbers and tomatoes, I tie them to poles and grow them up that way. And uh, can't conjure up in my mind the, an image yeah. of using a panel across the top of it. Yeah. I'm not saying it wouldn't work, but I just can't figure out how I would go about doing it. Just anything that provides support to the vine will get the job done. How about, uh, they asked about sawdust again. If adding sawdust to a regular garden, should it be aged at least a year? You talked about that. It should be aged a minimum of a year. If you look at it, and you pull the pile apart and it still looks like fresh sawdust inside there after a year, let it sit for another year. And uh, after a couple of years, it should be starting to turn kind of black, starting to look a little bit like compost, throw in a little bit of dirt and get it to start deteriorating and treat it a little bit like compost. And after two years, it should be ready. But the higher the pile of sawdust is, the longer it's going to take for it to, to yeah. cure, for lack of a better term. And it's going to have that temporary nitrogen deficiency right mm -hmm. you have to worry about. Uh, exactly. our, our panel question uh, clarified that you would you take the two raised beds and then you would bend and curve the panel to unite the two individual raised beds and put a bridge over them. That'll get the job done. It would definitely That's get great. the job done, yes. How about uh, what type of fertilizer would you suggest for raised beds that are three years old? I like to use slow release fertilizers. My favorite brand is Osmocote. And I don't know the specific analysis, but I'm thinking something like a 10 10 10 works really nicely. And I'm kind of lazy when it comes to fertilizing, so I'll mm -hmm. douse it pretty good with Osmocote in the spring and more or less forget about it. But I've also added some organic matter in the form of compost. Um, usually, uh, I usually just work with my own compost that I've made. But that and some uh, slow release fertilizer. Seems to get me through the years, through the entire growing season, just fine. How about, do you know where someone can get plans for a 
portable, lightweight, raised bed that's accessible to someone in a wheelchair so they can pull it up like a table. I'm sure there's lots of them online. Wheelchair garden designs. There are. There are. At our most recent Gardening Saturday program on Saturday, we had a presenter address that very topic about working with individuals with disabilities and uh, those individuals that want to continue to garden. Everything from adaptive tools to uh, chair height gardens. And uh, so I'd be happy to share some of that information from her presentation with you if you'd like. Just contact me. Um, how about, uh, do you ever use drainage rock in the bottom of the garden? Type of rock is sometimes used in a retaining wall. No, I don't. But if you remember the photo that showed the finished raised bed, there was a gap, an air gap, or a space on one end where the soil could spill out, where it was sitting flat on the ground on the other end. I do put some larger stones in the bottom just to hold the soil in around that perimeter, but it's not for drainage. It's just to help hold the soil in. That's a good idea. How about, uh, how about wheat hulls as a soil additive? It's organic. I can't see why they would be detrimental. I can no. think they could only help as long as, again, they didn't uh, draw the nitrogen away in the process of decomposing and uh, make it unavailable for plants themselves. I think if I was Dave Franz and I would say, I think sphagnum peat moss. Mm -hmm. Can't go wrong with that. Right. All these other exotic things are. I think just. You know, you can work with the available materials and uh, yes. don't go out of your way to buy exotic yeah. materials from foreign lands uh, because it might give you a minute advantage. Your best bet is working what's easily available. And who knows, this may not be your first raised bed. You may be like me. I'm actually, I have, I have materials. What you saw was the first of two that I'm building, and I'm planning to build a third one on top of that. So I'll have a total of five raised beds in that particular location. So don't make it more difficult than it needs to be. It's not rocket science, but you do need to do it correctly. Also, uh, do you rotate your crops? Yes, gardens? I absolutely do. How do you do that? I make sure I'm not planting tomatoes, potatoes, or peppers in the same location from one year to the next. And that's one of the reasons that you'll see probably by the end of this uh, spring, I'll have five raised beds there just to give me more options for rotation as well because uh rotating once every three years or four years is going to be a lot better than just back and forth okay um you know how about is there a, a, a special width of the raised bed set like why don't you go wider that's an excellent question tom i don't know if you thought it up yourself or somebody actually asked that but the reason we don't go any wider than four feet is because it's really hard to reach beyond two feet when you're sitting there picking weeds, maybe we're kind of lazy. Maybe we just don't have that long of a reach. But four feet wide seems to be about the proven best width for most raised beds. I suppose you could go a little bit wider, maybe six inches. But if you're starting to reach in beyond two feet, you're going to find it's uncomfortable. And it just won't be as enjoyable to you. So if you keep it a minimum, or I mean, if you keep it no wider than four feet, and I should have mentioned that when I was showing you my diagrams, that the end pieces need to be inside of the side pieces so that you keep that true four feet width there. Okay, and just want to emphasize a couple points. One is that you use pressure treated lumber. You don't have to buy that very expensive cedar lumber, right? You've had good success with pre mm -hmm. pre tw last 20 years, guaranteed. And also, Steve, I think it's worth noting that you had the same soil mix that Dave Franzen recommend for containers and that about one third of organic matter, like peat and moss, one third of sand, and then one third of topsoil, something like that. Right. So, so you guys are on the same wavelength as far as that goes. You don't have to use like Mel special mix or anything really too pricey. Are there any other special uh, questions out there before we move on? Last chance for a question. Are there any famous last words, Steve? Happy gardening. Happy spring. <laughs> get out there and grow the yeah, get vegetables. Out there. Get out there. Okay, Steve. Thanks. We appreciate it. Excellent job. See you, folks. Okay. And we're going to take a five-minute break right now, and then we're going to talk about some 
shady gardening practices.